Hello and welcome everyone to my airplane design tutorial number 19. I'm Sonja Englert and I was describing different forms of drag in my last video and how to recognize lower and higher drag shapes. In this one I'm continuing with other drag categories, starting with another very important one, the induced drag. The glider in this picture has very little of it. Induced drag is also called drag due to lift because without lift it does not exist. So far we only looked at airflow straight from the front at zero degrees angle of attack. But airplanes fly at different angles of attack. It varies with airspeed and loading. Any airplane has wings which create lift, which means there is low pressure on the wing upper surface and higher pressure on the wing lower surface. The difference in pressure has to equalize at the ends and it does so in the form of vortices. Vortices consume a lot of energy, so the higher the angle of attack is and the larger the pressure difference is, the larger are the vortices and the higher is the induced drag. All lifting surfaces produce induced drag. This can be seen when there is smoke or other particles in the air. Induced drag can be reduced by increasing the aspect ratio of a wing with a given wing area and also by selecting a good wing platform, which I discussed in my video on wing design. What the best aspect ratio is depends on the mission of the airplane. In cruise at low angle of attack, the induced drag is small and other drag components are prevalent. If the aircraft spends more time at higher lift coefficients, like gliders or those which experience high load factors due to steep turns, which in turn increases the wing loading, a higher aspect ratio will cut the overall drag down. The Eagle DW1 airplane with its 55 foot wingspan is a good example where high aspect ratio wings have been used because it flies slow and maneuvers with a heavy load. On limited power it is important to keep the wing loading and induced drag low. The next drag category is interference drag. If you measure the drag of a fuselage by itself and the wing drag by itself, it is less than what you would measure when you combined wings and fuselage. The difference is the interference drag. Any time there is a corner where two components are joined, the airflow around one affects the airflow around the other. The interference drag can be a few percent of the component drag. It cannot be eliminated completely but it can be reduced by shaping the junction appropriately. This means adding a fillet between the parts. The radius of the fillet should not be constant, but start small at the leading edge and increase in radius towards the trailing edge, as shown in the sketch of a wing fuselage junction. This motor glider is an example of a wing fuselage intersection without a fillet and with high interference drag. An airplane with a well-fared wing fuselage intersection and lower interference drag is this hurricane. The other common places where you have interference drag is where parts like struts, antennas and tail surfaces attach to the rest of the structure. Some types of drag have different names, but the drag they cause fall in one of the categories already described. The items I have just listed cause form drag but in their case it is called parasitic drag. It is called parasitic drag because they are add-ons to the airframe, which can be avoided with an appropriate design. This starts with small things like external wires, bolts, nuts, and even the round heads of rivets. Also falling into this category are the landing gear, steps, door handles, protruding lights, flap hinges, exhaust tailpipes, and a ventral fin some of which you can see on this airplane. Think about how the parasitic drag of this airplane could be reduced. For example, antennas could be installed internally in non-conductive parts of the airplane. The main landing gear could have wheel fairings or be retractable, and the external flap hinges could be internal rails. Another type of drag which powered airplanes have, but gliders don't, is cooling drag. When you look at this cowling, it is easy to visualize that this configuration will have a lot of drag. Cooling drag is not strictly a separate category, but a kind of form drag, 
consisting of blunt areas on the cowling, the inlet areas, the drag caused by internal flow, and the separation and interference caused by the exit flow. The cooling drag can be anywhere from a few percent of the total airplane drag to about 15 percent, depending on the design, so it pays to pay attention here. The cowling in this example is much cleaner looking, with inlets that have internal diffusers to keep the airflow attached as long as possible, and even high-performance engines can work efficiently behind a well-streamlined cowling with a minimum frontal area and cross-section, as in this race plane. Other things I have yet not yet mentioned here are gaps, specifically control surface gaps, but also gaps between other airplane parts. This picture shows an example with a very large gap. The air can flow through the gap, especially when the control surface is deflected, and this increases the drag by the disturbance of the external flow, while also reducing the pressure difference between the two sides of the lifting surface. This reduces the effectiveness of the control surface. To obtain the same response as for a control surface with a gap seal, the open gap control surface has to be deflected more, which causes additional drag. The latter does not apply to control surfaces which are designed to have a gap, as some ailerons are. There the slot is used for improving the roll rate, but it adds drag just the same. Basically, the smaller the gap is, the better, as long as the control surface can still move freely, even under full load. Flexible gap seals work very well and are used on most, gl most gliders. To put everything into perspective, I made a table with the different types of drag of a small airplane and their contributions to the total drag. The proportions of the various types of drag vary with the flight condition. This table shows the percentages for a typical small airplane in climb in column C and high-speed cruise in column D. The wing drag is divided into profile and induced drag. In climb, the wing has proportionally the highest drag because of its induced drag. In cruise, the fuselage is the largest contributor because of its large cross-section. Note that the parasitic drag can add up to more than the drag of the tail. I have used the picture of an airplane shown earlier in this video to have some fun and cleaned up the airframe and reduced its drag. The maximum level speed of the first example airplane is 134 knots. If the airplane was cleaned up as shown and the parasitic drag was reduced from 17.6% to 0.2% by making the gear retractable installing antennas internally, removing steps and eliminating external hinges, the maximum new speed would be 149 knots on the same power. You can see that attention to detail can make a lot of difference. So if you care about speed and efficiency, on many airplanes there are quite a few things you can do to improve both with just small changes. It is even easier to do this with a new design, so go out and have fun with your projects.